We are the anchors of Queer News Tonight, and this evening we discuss the queer headlines. The Master Chorale honors Matthew Shepard's legacy with the Craig Hella Johnson's Considering Matthew Shepard at Sunshine Cathedral Center for Performing Arts, May 31st to June 1. The Trevor Project's 2024 survey reveals the dire impacts of political actions on LGBTQ plus youth, from mental health to safety. In Matanzas, Cuba, Reverend Saralagi runs an LGBTQ plus inclusive church, defying Cuba's past repression. Cuba has come a long way. The University of North Florida faces drastic changes as legislative decisions force the closure of vital centers, including LGBTQ plus interfaith and women's support services. Florida Outcoast Convention will be from August 12th to the 14th at Lowe's Coral Gables Hotel. It is the premier LGBTQ plus tourism summit in Florida. Well, good evening and welcome to Queer News Tonight. This is the world's first and only LGBTQ plus evening television news. We're broadcasting live and then we're available on demand and we're available on all smart televisions, including Roku, Apple TV, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, Twitch, YouTube, and even Facebook. It's time to queer up the news for Thursday, May 2nd, 2024. We are live and literally out of the closet and into the headlines. So many of your important stories we're going to tell this evening on Queer News Tonight. This is the world's first live daily LGBTQ evening news show, literally out of the closet and into the headlines on Queer News Tonight. This is the world's first and only unedited live LGBTQ plus evening news show. Whatever happens, unique in LGBTQ plus news, you will see it and hear it. Hotspots Magazine Happening on Television Network is a nonprofit 501c3 media company in the same model of PBS and NPR, but designed for the LGBTQ plus community. Our mission? To support the 11 pillars of our LGBTQ plus community. We want to inform and educate the key issues of our queer culture, the black community, Latino, lesbians and queer women, trans, students, youth, seniors, HIV AIDS healthcare, business, social justice and faith. Please help us support our community. We are part of one of the largest LGBTQ plus nonprofit media companies in America, Hotspots Magazine and Happening Out Television Network. In 2024, our magazine is celebrating 40 years of the LGBTQ plus experience and our television news, talk and entertainment shows support our mission to educate the LGBTQ plus and broader community. Well, let's meet tonight's anchors at Queer News Tonight. Uh, let's begin by welcoming Yvonne Rohrbacher, a resident of Fort Lauderdale since 1987 and a two-time honoree of SFGN's esteemed Out 50. She lives in Fort Lauderdale with her spouse, Linda. Yvonne is the founding vice president of the GLCCSF. She is also a board member and Women's Fund volunteer at the Stonewall National Museum and Archives and a committee member and performer at Lesbian Thesbians. I love that name. And I know welcome. you love that name, Al. <laughs> I do. Hi, welcome. everyone. <laughs> All right. Let's also welcome Greg Shapiro, an inductee into the Chicago LGBTQ, I'm sorry, LGBT Hall of Fame. Greg is the author of two short story collections and seven books of poetry. My goodness, seven. Exhausted. He's an, an entertainment journalist whose celebrity interviews and <clears throat> reviews have run in a variety of print and online publications. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. I'm so gosh darn happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And let's welcome anchor Rachel Cavello. Rachel is CEO for Outcoast.com, an LGBTQ plus travel website for Florida destinations. She is based in St. Petersburg and has come over for the show and uh, continues her work to unite the state's LGBTQ plus communities to encourage interstate travel. She is the director of Florida's most important LGBTQ plus travel conference called FLOC, being held in Coral Gables August 12th. Welcome, Rachel. 
Thank you. It was totally worth the four-hour drive across the state. Yeah. <laughs> and that was just coming up from Coral Gable. Right. <laughs> Next, let's yeah. welcome Bright Carlin. He is the artistic director of the Master Corral of South Florida, one of Florida's most important cultural arts organizations. Brett is leading 120 singers, guiding them through choral orchestral masterpieces. As a member of our LGBTQ plus community, he is showcasing his talent as conductor of the Master Chorale of South Florida. Welcome, Brett. Thank you so much, Al. It's great to be here. Very exciting to have you here. First time you've been at Queer News tonight. Yes. We welcome you. No longer a words and and of course, this is tonight's lead anchor, the gay guru, Al Ferguson. He has traveled to more than 137 countries worldwide. Al has hosted and coordinated with RuPaul's Drag Race for many seasons and is the creative inspiration of this show, Queer News Tonight, and the original host of It's Happening Out. Today, he is an executive producer and content creator for Hotspots Happening Out. Hey, Al. It's good seeing you, Greg. Thank you for the nice introduction. We are the reporters for Queer News Tonight, and this evening we begin with the queer headlines. The LGBTQ plus community in South Florida and across America is very diverse. Our community across the world is vast. And here are the bullet points of the queer news for today, Thursday, May 2nd, 2024. First, this evening, let's queer up South Florida and Florida. Brett Carlin leads Master Corral of South Florida May 31st and June 1st at the Matthew Shepard Concert. In a poignant tribute to the enduring memory of Matthew Shepard, the Master Corral of South Florida is going to proudly present Craig Hella Johnson's Considering Matthew Shepard. It is an incredible June Pride Month tribute from the Master Chorale of South Florida. The artistic director of the Master Chorale of South Florida is Brett Carlin, and he will conduct the event. This evocative and compassionate musical response commemorates the 25th anniversary of the infamous anti-gay hate crime that claimed Shepard's life. The concert is set to take place at the Sunshine Cathedral Center for Performing Arts on May 31st and June 1st. It promises to be an unforgettable experience. The interactive concert will draw upon Matt's own words, interviews with his parents, and newspaper accounts of his tragic murder. The performance weaves together a narrative and story that is both soul-rendering and profoundly cathartic. Importantly, students will be admitted free of charge, ensuring that all members of the community have access to this transformative experience. As part of this season's Concert for a Cause, a portion of the proceeds from ticket sales will be donated to SunServe, a local organization dedicated to providing critical life assistance and mental health services of the most vulnerable members of our South Florida LGBTQ community. The Master Chorale of South Florida was founded in 2003, and it is a very prestigious ensemble, including 120 singers from Broward, Miami-Dade County, and Palm Beach County. Committed to inspiring diverse audiences, it delivers exceptional choral performances, serving as the voice of South Florida with its transformative power and engaging presence. You want to purchase your tickets for this concert today at the Master Corral of uh, Master Corral South Florida uh, dot org and join in honoring the spirit of compassion, inclusion, and resilience. We are also very excited that Brett Carlin, the artistic director and conductor of the Master Choral of South Florida, is an anchor with us this evening <laughs> at Queer News Tonight. Brett, um, Matthew Shepard is one of the legacy names of civil rights in our community. It was a rallying cry uh, for us. And when I heard that the Choral was going to do this concert, I thought first, my goodness, am I getting old? It's 25 mm, years mm, already. Remarkably. And how honoring it is that the Corral would, would take on this piece. First off, tell us about the Corral itself. You're a member of the LGBTQ community. Um, it's uh, 120 uh, voices taking on some of the most inspirational 
uh, music in the world. Tell us about the chorale. Uh, exactly right. So the Master Chorale of South Florida is a professional symphony chorus. So typically we're performing works that are of epic proportion and very large scale. So these are works typically by Bach and Brahms and Beethoven and Handel, these sorts of big Mozart Requiem, Verdi Requiem pieces. The organization is now in its 21st season and I've been with the organization for 10 years now, mm. fortunately. Mm. And in the last few seasons, we've begun to reevaluate our programming because most of these symphony choruses or symphony organizations of course perform music of iconic classical composers but it's clear to me now that both in South Florida and in communities around the country and around the world they want to attend and support concerts that are more than just about the performance of the music so a couple of seasons ago we initiated a new annual concert for a cause project mm. in which we partner with a non-musical nonprofit and it sounds a little hokey, but we give voice or raise attention and awareness to the important mission of that nonprofit mm. through the performance of an iconic musical masterwork or a contemporary piece. We partnered with the Stonewall National Museum and Archives, which is located right down here in South Florida in Wilton Manors, of course. We've also partnered with the Southeast Florida chapter of the Alzheimer's Association in a celebration of music's ability to connect with individuals when they've lost the ability to communicate. So now in our third annual Concert for a Cause, We'll be performing Considering Matthew Shepard with all of our 120 singers. Mm. And we've engaged a stage director to join us for the very first time in order to tell this story in a sensitive and meaningful way. You know, it's, it's wonderful. I'm going to ask you about when the Master Chorale is going to be moving to Madonna music, but I'll that <laughs> in a couple of minutes. It's interesting to me uh, of, of the kind of music that the, the, the Master Chorale uh, performs. Uh, challenging uh, classical music. I'm curious uh, from the standpoint of you being a member of um, the uh, community, I understand many of the singers uh, that are associated uh, with the chorale are also members of the community. How is the intersection of the master chorale and, and the LGBT community, LGBTQ plus community, especially in our interest in this kind of music? Well, it becomes a very special opportunity, I think, for a majority of our members who have a little bit more experience in life in particular, mm. who remember what happened on October 6th in 1998. And I was born in 1986, so I was a young man, but I do remember seeing the news story. I wasn't out yet at that time. But many of our members not only remember this awful, tragic incident, but were themselves in San Francisco, in LA, mm -hmm. in New York, and many other communities, a part of candlelight vigils as well. Mm -hmm. So for individuals to now sing a work that is organized with a prologue, a passion story and an epilogue that does try to communicate a message of love, that does attempt to communicate a message of clasping hands and moving forward together in love and a celebration of humanity and peace and kindness. It becomes a very cathartic opportunity for myself as well as many of our LGBTQ plus members of the chorale to experience music and the performance of music in a uniquely personal way. Mm, that is lovely. I um I uh, I, I also think it's, it's interesting. Uh, the Stonewall Museum, we, uh, we, Hotspots Happening Out has partnered with them. And, um, and we are going to do a series, uh, starting in Pride Month, but through the entire rest of the year. This is the 55th anniversary of, uh, the Stonewall Uprising, the Stonewall Riots, uh, at the Stonewall Inn in New York. And we're going to tell the 55 greatest moments since June 28th, 1969, mm. and Matthew Shepard's moment makes the list mm. uh, yeah. of, of one of the 55 biggest moments in the LGBT community. For, for the activism of um, a choral group that is, uh, that is delivering Brahms, for example, what was the motivation to come in and, and focus on Matthew Shepard's important, clearly, and, and it's a concert with a cause. But but what gravitated the Master Chorale to, to um, a program 
as deep for LGBT as this? Uh, initially, it's really the musical setting of this incident and of Matt's story. Mm. This was a piece composed by Craig Hella Johnson in 2016. Of course, the composition of this work started a little bit earlier than that, but it is often characterized as what's called a fusion oratorio. An oratorio is a work that is semi-staged or has light staging elements and costume elements, but largely speaking, the music is delivered directly to the audience. And the reason that this is called a fusion oratorio is because there is a wide variety of styles used in the music. So one movement is Southern Gospel. The other sounds like a Dolly Parton song. Then you hear Bach, and then you hear lush romantic chords and romantic harmonies. Above all, the music tries to communicate a powerful message of hope, of love, mm -hmm. of kindness, and of peace. But it really, the first thing that attracted me to wanting to program this music, introduce members of the South Florida and queer community unity to this piece is because it is such an unbelievably gorgeous composition with different poetry set by Craig, the composer of the work, but also by Leslie and Newman. Mm -hmm. Leslie and Newman is a poet and author who is slated to give a presentation at the university in Wyoming that Matthew was attending. Um, the attack happened one of the nights that she was supposed to make a presentation. Afterwards, she published this collection of works where there is an anthropomorphizing of the fence that Matthew was tragically tied mm -hmm. to. And in this oratorio... The barbed wire fence. Barbed yes. Wire. And in this oratorio, considering Matthew Shepard, there are different moments that are essentially monologues mm -hmm. from the perspective of the fence. And so we have first the fence before. Next, the fence that night. The fence that night is the most emotional movement of the piece mm. where the fence, the speaker, this baritone singer speaks of holding him all night. And then eventually the fence the day after, the fence one week later as individuals come and leave ribbons and leave pictures and leave candles and things like that. Mm -hmm. So this is an extraordinarily powerful piece that uses metaphor, exquisitely beautiful poetry, but above all else, this hopeful intrinsic feeling throughout the music that amidst this tragedy, this is a story that must be told, mm. and this is a story that must be remembered so that we avoid or never repeat these tragic acts of violence again. Well, I'm really glad you mentioned Leslie. Uh, most people may remember her as the person who wrote Heather Has Two Mommies. That's like her famous kids book. But, and, I, and, I, and as a poet myself, I admire the way that Craig Hella Johnson not only incorporated Leslie Newman, but also poet Michael Dennis Brown into considering uh, Matthew Shepard. It's quite amazing. I've listened to it uh, on YouTube. I've, I've listened to some of the stuff and it's, it's very moving and it is important to remember this event, absolutely. Did you, um, I'm, I'm curious for the, the Master Chorale uh, to bring um, a, a subject like this. Uh, it launches June Pride Month. Uh, the, the performance uh, is a Friday and Saturday night, Friday night, May 31st, and then Saturday night, uh, June 1st. I imagine that that was very intention. Yes, absolutely, yeah. of yeah. course. And, 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 and what was behind that decision? To uh, well, I'll share with you, I guess, uh, personally, not in my role as artistic director and conductor of the Master Chorale, I'm a nerd. I'm a homebody. I'm more comfortable at like a board game cafe than I am at the club or at a bar and that sort of thing. So when there is a Pride Month celebration, I am generally not in attendance at large pool parties and clubs. Not to say that they're bad. Every, there's different strokes for different folks. They're absolutely fun events and engaging events. But for me, I found this to be a cultural exploration of an important yet tragic event that allows us to acknowledge during Pride Month, not only a celebration of our identity, not only a celebration of our culture, but also a reflection, mm. an introspection, and celebration of a cultural work that allows us to remember a story that we can tell each other to avoid this ever happening again. To, oh, um, you go ahead. No, I have to say though, if, if the show is as half as good, uh, if you're conducting is half as good as the way you speak, and <laughs> <laughs> sign me up. I want to be there. I mean, it's beautiful. I, the way you've, I mean, I, I actually, I cannot remember the exact name of the show, but I saw a play about Matthew Shepard, I can't remember. Probably the Laramie Project. Yeah, the Laramie Project. Yes, Thank most you. definitely. Oh, was, mm, it was right extraordinary on the tip of my work. It was yes. an incredible show. Yes. I I was probably around. I I 
was born in 80. So, you know, that was my high school years when that was happening, the end of my high school year. So, um, but it, you've explained it so eloquently <laughs> and I'm sure you can even better. And so. as much as we love the Laramie Project, imagine uh, the news and, and poetry uh, and then 120 voices. Yeah, that's most awesome. definitely. That's, it's, it's just going yeah. to be absolutely incredible. Uh, we want to, uh, I'm, I'm giving production a heads up, we're, uh, we're going to show uh, something from uh, the chorale in just a moment. But one, one last thing that I wanted to uh, focus on is uh, the tie-in uh, with SunServe. Uh, SunServe is um, a beloved organization here in South Florida and what they do in varieties of different uh, areas. Uh, for um, LGBT and 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 health and women and trans, but one of their big emphasis is for youth. Correct. And and no time since Matthew Shepard's mm. murder in 1999 have we seen LGBT children attacked um, in America in the degree that we are watching. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about that and the decision to say, well, if you're uh, if you're a student, just come to the chorale. Well, um, as part of Master Chorale's annual Concert for a Cause program and initiative, we decided that it made the most sense for us to partner with a non-musical nonprofit for considering Matthew Shepard, like SunServe, that has an extraordinary youth services mm -hmm. program. And it just so happened that I maintain a personal friendship, friendship, excuse me, with the director of the youth services program, Mario De Pedro. Oh, so as I was talking to him a little bit about this musical project, the partnership sort of formed naturally as we started to have some conversations. So 10% of all of the ticket proceeds that Master Corral earns will go directly mm. to help support and fund the youth programs that wow. SunServe provides, which includes free mental health counseling, safe space, including a queer prom and other queer events mm. where individuals from the LGBTQ plus community can feel at home, can feel comfortable, can feel safe, as well as housing for LGBTQ plus youth if they find themselves in a situation where of course they are in need. Mm -hmm. So this partnership seemed like a beautiful celebration of unfortunately a, a very tragic and very ugly legacy or, or tragic event. But we're hoping that we can bring some sort of beauty out of it. Yeah. We're hoping that we can bring some sort of hope and some sort of guidance for individuals now. It's really a beautiful story. And when you when you think about the intersections that are here, we're broadcasting at the Happening Out Studios at Sunshine Cathedral. It just happens that SunServe's uh, student and youth program is right above. Yes, of course. Right here at Sunshine. Uh, I have been to uh, the, the graduation party that SunServe uh, <laughs> does in the parking lot here at SunServe. And in, in the times that I've been upstairs and the times I've been into the parking lot events, I never dreamed that there would be a connection with such an artistic, uh, amazing yeah. artistic event as the Master Chorale of South Florida, all intersecting Confluence. together over considering Matthew Shepard. Mm, it's definitely. just an amazing event <laughs> that you don't want to miss. And, and before we leave uh, the story, we want to give uh, an opportunity to... I, I don't know who this guy is that's talking, but, but watch this. In the anniversary season, the Master Chorale is already looking forward to the next 20 years of music making and performing the world's greatest choral orchestral masterworks ever written, commissioning new pieces by leading composers, and expanding access to music education through our free family concert series. Art does not exist in this country without philanthropy. So if you're interested in making a meaningful investment in strengthening the cultural fabric of your community, I encourage you to join me in making a donation to the Master Corral today. Thank you again for your support over the last 20 years. Next, let's queer up student and youth culture. Trevor Project says anti-LGBTQ plus laws are creating 
public health crisis for LGBTQ plus youth. According to the Trevor Project's 2024 U.S. National Survey, recent political actions such as bans on gender-affirming care for minors and laws permitting the misgendering, outing, or exclusion of queer students have profoundly impacted LGBTQ plus youth. Approximately 90% of LGBTQ plus youth respondents reported negative effects on their well-being due to these policies. The safety of queer students in schools is particularly concerning, with nearly half of LGBTQ plus individuals aged 13 to 17 experiencing bullying in the past year. Alarmingly, those who endured bullying exhibited significantly higher rates of attempted suicide. A staggering 45% of transgender and non-binary young individuals revealed that their families have contemplated relocating due to these laws. Overall, 39% of LGBTQ plus youth have seriously considered suicide in the past year with even higher rates among transgender and non-binary youth and queer youth of color. Again, this means four out of every 10 LGBTQ plus youth in America have considered suicide. Despite such shocking statistics, half of LGBTQ plus youth seeking mental health care in the past year were unable to access it. In 2023, over 550 anti-LGBTQ plus bills surfaced in the U.S., with 80 enacted into law. This year, 487 such bills have been introduced and 21 have passed. These measures often target LGBTQ plus students, aiming to censor curriculum or enforce outings leading to discrimination within educational settings. The Trevor Project National Survey reveals we have a crisis among LGBTQ plus youth in America. When I was thinking about the relocating thing, I was thinking about, okay, I'm bad at this. There's a sports ball player from down here who had a, a trans child and they left whatever team it was to move someplace else because the, the child felt threatened. Right, am I right out there? There was some, yeah, I, I can't think of who it is. But anyway, so that is unbelievably shocking. And then I know, how the hundreds of anti-LGBTQ plus bills are affecting me and other adults my age and younger. So this Trevor Project survey gives us the numbers when it comes to the LGBTQ plus youth, and they are disproportionately impacted as many of the bills target them. They're specifically aimed at the young. And it's no wonder that it feels like such a hopeless time that many of them are struggling with these kinds of uh, thoughts of suicide and mental health issues. It's it feels hopeless to me, and I'm sure it feels hopeless to them. It feels like a huge step backward. <laughs> the consolation is that they that these bills are slowing down and that they're not all passing. So the huge step backward, I think, maybe has at least been arrested. I don't know when it's going to turn around, so to speak. But <sighs> I think the trend is slowing, at least. Thank goodness. We certainly don't need another Matthew Shepard. I'm, I'm curious when you when you say that um, there there's a school of thought. However, um, the passage of laws this year have dropped 400 percent this year versus 2023. But there's a school of thought that says, well, that is because the people that are voting for these laws in state houses hasn't changed their opinion. They've just recognized that they are in an election year. And that gay culture that DeSantis proved in the presidential candidate, uh, his candidacy, that attacks were not, mm -hmm. uh, gay culture attacks were not a good strategy to propel for the electorate. And they've suspended mm. the hate, not eliminated the hate. What do y'all think about that? That wow, that's it's, wrong. it's not that I, know. I have to agree. Are getting Everything better. gets done it's for just, political reasons. Mm. We're pausing it. Do you think yeah. that that might be true? I'm, I never thought about that. It's I, I, possible. I think it's sad when we get to a point where we say, well, it's they've slowed down passing the laws because mm -hmm. they've still passed some. You know, it's we're almost celebrating the slowdown. I'd rather celebrate the overturning of them and the not letting them happen in the first place. Right. Um, so that that makes me a little sad. Um, very sad, I guess. But I think it's just it's hard to wrap your head around it. 
it's just, I was bullied when I was younger, but mine was more because of my size as a youth, not because of being LGBTQ. I didn't come out um, till much later, but I, the Gen Z population, I mean, look at the Gen Z population. It's a growing population of LGBTQ kids and the number of people now that are potentially being bullied in schools. And, and I'm hoping that some of these laws slowing down might also be because a lot of these people also have Gen Z people in their lives that are being directly impacted by these laws. We, we remind everybody, uh, uh, Greg and I, in our demographic, our generational demographic, uh, only 3.7% identify as LGBT. Um, Gen Z uh, studies show 20% <laughs> identify. Nice. And, and this is the fear that's created in the GOP and mm -hmm. radical evangelical and GOP of, wait, are you just thinking it's cool to be uh, queer and that's why the number is so high? Or is it really those kind of numbers exist, mm. but our generation, we didn't come out mm. or we didn't yeah. identify, mm. so you know, we don't know that. You know, one other thing I want to um, mention about uh, the Trevor Project and this study is the National Survey proves for those people that think we got marriage in 2015, we're good, we're good. Mm -mm. This study proves how not only untrue that is, but actually hurtful mm -hmm. those kind of feelings mm -hmm. and statements are. Because at the end of the day, uh, the national survey by the Travel Project proves systemic discrimination. Mm -hmm. Because in America tonight on the NBC Nightly News, they would lead with a story of a major national study that said four out of every 10 youth in America are considering suicide. It would be an all-stop moment. That's what is going on in LGBT. Mm -hmm. That is systemic discrimination mm -hmm. by a broader class and community. And we should be paying attention to that. An older representation in LGBT, when you go, I got marriage, I'm good, you should be thinking mm -hmm. about <laughs> who we're pulling along yeah. with us uh, right. for LGBT youth. And one one last thing before we move on that I want to mention. One of the things that's very sad to me about this reporting is the Trevor Project. The Trevor Project is so incredibly important in America. A 24 hour a day suicide hotline right. for those four and 10 kids that are at one o'clock in the morning going I just can't get up tomorrow and go to school. Yes. And the Trevor Project sits there for them. Mm -hmm. And the Trevor Project over the last two years with the hate that we've watched, the the bullying that we've watched to our, our corporate and our business mm -hmm. structures, the Trevor Project has had difficulty in meeting their financial mm -hmm. needs that they have to serve uh, LGBT youth in America, have, uh, have laid off many uh, counselors, even phone emergency coverage. And the ramifications of what we've seen over these last couple of years by radical evangelicals, radical conservatives, radical haters, the direct impact of that hate is on organizations mm -hmm. like the Trevor Project, which are yeah. so incredibly vitally mm -hmm. needed. These are the actual impacts mm -hmm. of what we're watching. Four in 10 thinking about suicide, and we're delivering less services to be able to help them. Yes, and I'm sorry to hear that. We need the Trevor Project more than ever now, <laughs> because we would hope that eventually we would grow out of needing such things, mm. but mm. not yet. Not mm. yet. That's not yet. Well, oh boy. Next, let's queer up the world view. Cuba of the past sent gay people to labor camps, and today, there is LGBTQ plus inclusive church. All right, so a bit of good news. In the historic port city of Matanzas, the Reverend Elaine Saralegi proudly presides over an LGBTQ plus inclusive church adorned in a rainbow colored clergy stole. Saralegi welcomes same sex couples and offers a sanctuary where all are embraced without exclusion. This scene stands in stark contrast to Cuba's past, where after the 1959 revolution led by Fidel Castro, gay individuals were systematically repressed, and many were sent to labor camps. 
However, in recent years, the communist-run island has made significant strides towards LGBTQ plus equality. I remember the Mariel Boatlift, the information about how many gay people they sent here to Miami. Thank you. <laughs> Legislation enacted in 2022, including a government-backed family law, has granted same-sex couples the right to marry and adopt. It highlights a monumental shift in societal acceptance. Yet this progress has not been without resistance. The Catholic Church and evangelical groups oppose these measures. Well, there's nothing new there. Invoking religious rhetoric to challenge LGBTQ plus rights. Despite this opposition, though, the government's campaign for equality prevailed, garnering overwhelming support from voters. President Miguel Diaz-Canel hailed the passage of the law as a triumph of love. Meanwhile, Mariela Castro, a prominent advocate for LGBTQ plus rights and daughter of former President Raul Castro, has expressed profound joy at the progress made. As Cuba continues to navigate its path toward progress and equality, the emergence of LGBTQ plus inclusive spaces like Sara Ligi's church serves as a beacon of hope on the island. And a beacon of hope sometimes is all we need. I couldn't help but contrast this to the Trevor Project's statistics. Cuba's a small island, and people live close together. Here in the United States, sometimes I feel our progress is delayed by the fact that we have such a vast, you know, just there's so much land out there. Mm -hmm. People, you have an LGBTQ plus person who may be the only one for 200 square miles. Right. Right. And it's a little tougher for this kind of progress to happen in those types of areas in the United States. Congratulations, Cuba. I mean, we're not being sent to labor camps yet. <laughs> but and the systematic that oppression. That happened the year I was born. Oh, God. And the systematic oppression is in the early stages here. But even in Cuba, we're significant strides towards LGBTQ plus. Uh, equality are being made. There is proof change is possible. Yeah. Rachel, you're a, a tourism, LGBT tourism expert. What do you think about when you, you hear a, a news like this of what's going on on the island? Um, well, as a travel person, that's all about inclusive tourism <laughs> and knows that there are certain places people won't travel when they don't feel included to be there. I think this definitely is um, is good from a tourism perspective, for sure. I'm also curious to know how much they're they're closest to places like um uh you know puerto rico and the different islands around you know around that region how much that might impact because destinations like a puerto rico are very inclusive um so that's always interesting to me whether that has impacted you know and, and in yeah. florida you get a lot of people that are moving up from puerto rico moving up from Cu like people from cuba it's true depending on what part of florida you're in and um i it's interesting to see the different acceptance among the cultures um, whereas in, in certain destinations in Florida where a lot of Cubans live, it tends to go a little bit more right leaning mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, Republican leaning. And then where you have Puerto Ricans, it tends to be a little bit more left. But I wonder if that influence is starting to overlap a little bit. Mm -hmm. too, but. You know, it's uh, it's interesting to me. And in, in 2024 at Queer News Tonight, uh, we have reported on what's going on in Africa and mm -hmm. Nigeria and Uganda. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, have invoked death penalty uh, law. Yes. Uh, Yemen is going to crucify 12 uh, people who um, um, uh, are gay. And, uh, and they're either going to be stoned or crucified. <laughs> and, and it's an ongoing uh, story. Um, you contrast that of what we've watched over the last couple of years in Cuba, and it's a dramatically different yeah. world. As somebody who has been to Cuba ugh, more than a dozen times, I've been to Havana Pride. Mariela Castro's organization runs uh, Havana Pride. Cuba is a very interesting place. The idea that um, a, le uh, uh, a lesbian pastor could have a church mm. in Matanzas uh, 10 years ago was an impossible, it was an impossible concept. And in 10 years, they've been able to make this, uh, this uh, progress. Mm. One of the things I also think is very interesting is for the Cuba haters, of which there are many listening to me right now, uh, uh, they hate Cuba because they hate the Castros and the government. And, and I completely understand and I completely understand. But you can't hate the Cuban people. 
And at the end of the day, Cuba has made such dramatic pro progress. This story will be rejected by large swaths of people in South Florida <laughs> because they want no good news right. coming out of Cuba at all. Good point. Well, I'm sorry. In LGBT, we got lots of good news going on in Cuba, and, and we're happy to report uh, that, uh, that story. We can't mix the politics and uh, the civil and human rights of its people uh, unconditionally. And in LGBT, things have improved over the last number of years. I, I think, you know, if, if Cuba is paying attention to what's happening in Florida, too, we're all understanding that when you make these anti-LGBTQ laws, it, you know, going back to the tourism perspective, you lose tourists and not just tourists, you lose groups, you lose groups of people traveling, which is lots and lots and lots of money. I mean, South Florida sadly has been hurt by this quite a bit this past year. So I'm hoping, or last year or two, I'm hoping that some of these islands might just let Florida set the example of what not to do with laws. <laughs> and that comes from an yes. LGBT person. <laughs> Don't do Don't do Florida. Yes. yes. Right. Okay. okay. And Rachel, uh, we're going to have you move on and we're going to talk about I was education. so excited about the travel um, conversation. <laughs> um, yeah. Next, let's clear up education. Um, Ron DeSantis, anti-DEI law forces Florida University LGBTQ plus centers to shut down. The University of North Florida, UNF, is in the news for significant changes that have occurred due to a recent anti-DEI anti legislative decision. UNF has shut down several of its vital centers, including those dedicated to LGBTQ plus intercult intercultural interfaith and women's issues. This decision comes as a response to Governor Ron DeSantis' 2023 law, which prohibits publicly funded universities from allocating funds towards diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Among the affected centers is the LGBTQ Center, a cornerstone of support and advocacy that has served the university community for 18 years. Its closure just seven days before graduation underscores the abruptness of the decision and its impact on students and staff alike. DeSantis's words while signing this law were, quote, DEI is better viewed as standing for discrimination, exclusion, and indoctrination, and that has no place in our public, public institutions, end quote. Critics argue that this law defines DEI programs in a manner that could hinder efforts to address issues of discrimination and inequality. Moreover, the closure of these centers risks tarnishing UNF's reputation as a champion of diversity and inclusion. Previously recognized as one of the best LGBTQ plus inclusive campuses in the state by Campus Pride, UNF now faces scrutiny over its commitment to fostering a diverse and welcoming environment. Carlos Guillermo Smith, a former Florida House Democrat and advocate for LGBTQ plus rights, condemned the anti-DEI law, labeling it, quote, a rubber stamp for Ron DeSantis' agenda of censorship and surveillance, end quote. LGBTQ plus advocates suggest this is just the first of many Florida colleges and universities that will follow the University of North Florida's actions. Oh, <laughs> it's so tough. These universities, you know, new college, all these different places that, what happened to, to the like separation of not just church and state, but like learning and state. I don't, right. I don't see why we have this much control over. My house is on the days. north wall of New College, and uh, growing up in Sarasota, it was a beacon. is one of the greatest mm. uh, thinking uh, public uh, universities in America, which has been destroyed. Oh yeah. I it's not just the brain drain of the students coming in. It's the, who would want to teach 40 at one of, of these all places? Of the professors resign. I mean, you know, we have two more years of this castrated putz to deal with. And if you think he's on a vengeful tear, just imagine what Trump will be like if he's reelected. This is DeSantis's version of revenge. Just so, please vote. Well, we and, say yes. And one of the sad thing the super heartbreaking parts about all of these rules and the colleges changing and the support services is so many of these universities are also health support services mm, for absolutely. our LGBTQ what? plus community members, mm. especially our transgender, non-binary right. community that may need someone to talk to. They're going through the most 
difficult times yeah. of their life. Counseling. I mean, counseling, counseling yeah. and right. support. And Mental health. I had a friend who needed some support and uh, it was suggested a local, um, someone at the local, like I live near USF in St. Pete, um, St. Pete side. And it was suggested that this person reach out for support services from USF and then someone else who's was a, is a prominent transgender person in our community said, hey, be careful now because if you're going through university, a state university, everything's oh. tracked and you just never know. And so it makes you a little oh, bit more cautious to get the support state. you need. Yeah. Well, that, and I go back to the Trevor Project where it said half of the people that are needing, the LGBTQ plus youth that are needing help or mental health services cannot get it. Mm. And I would have never dreamed in a place as populated as Florida mm where we have wonderful cities, wonderful universities, and so many folks that that would be happening here, that these people can't get help. Just the very idea that they had to hear about <laughs> these things shutting down must have terrified <laughs> some of the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, if, we, if we don't realize that um, an LGBT center at the University of North, uh, North Florida has direct effect on us, we probably are not paying attention yeah. the way that we should. Mm -hmm. We have many anchors at Queer News Tonight that are professors mm -hmm. at Broward College, sure. at Florida International, mm -hmm. at Florida they Atlantic, that continue to participate in Queer News Tonight, but don't want to be identified uh, related uh, to what the work is mm -hmm. that they do mm -hmm. at their colleges. And the reason is, is because of the scrutiny of association with Queer yeah. News Tonight and their college. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. what's going on at UNF and, and other campuses around the state uh, has a direct effect even on us mm -hmm. with a 55-year-old uh, professor, a doctorate. Well, yeah, uh, and that's and, a form and, and of being in the closet. And it's just so, yeah. it's disgusting to think that, that the things that we laugh yeah. about, oh, 30 years ago, we didn't let people take pictures at dances, we're back there in yeah. some way yes. right well let, let's let's end the the conversation of what's happening in dei in florida by talking about a success story the university of miami is a national recognized and nationally important program mm -hmm. um the the lgbt student union there mm -hmm. led by dr vega is really one of the finest programs in the United States. They have a queer studies minor at the University of Miami that currently has 80 students that uh, this coming week will graduate in a special lavender mm -hmm. uh, uh, wow. graduation ceremony. Uh, they have dozens of clubs and organizations that embrace LGBT at the University of Miami. And Miami will proudly say, we are very proud of our diversity uh, and inclusion programs, not only for LGBT, but for black, for women, for all kinds of things. That's beautiful. And it's a fabulous story. And we can say that in this story because they're private. Mm -hmm. That's it's the difference between <laughs> being uh, private yes. and public, yeah, That's for sure. Well, I, for and sure. we are very fortunate to be in the Miami and Fort Lauderdale area. The Greater Miami Convention of Visitors Bureau, who I work with very closely mm -hmm. in my professional life, is supporting the event that you talked about, mm -hmm. that, that racialist. Yeah. And they actually do a course about LGBTQ uh, plus tourism in Miami, and members have to... Uh, take that course mm -hmm. wow. that if you want to be part of the cbb you have to take that course yeah. mm -hmm. excellent love that all right well university of north florida we're thinking about <laughs> next let's queer up travel as we yeah. are speaking about it <laughs> the florida outcoast convention for lgbtq plus tourism is coming to coral gables august 12th through the 14th an exciting lgbtq plus event is set to take place in florida this summer the Florida Outcoast Convention, called Flock, is gearing up for its return in 2024, promising to be the premier gathering for professionals in the LGBTQ plus tourism industry. This unique conference aims to bring together destination leaders, agencies, and tourism professionals from both within and outside the state. The goal is to engage in meaningful conversations on effectively reaching, supporting, and understanding LGBTQ plus travelers, 
meeting host and group sales clients. This is especially important in an era when many national and international organizations have issued travel warnings and some even calling for boycotts for LGBTQ plus travel to Florida. Schedule for August 12th to the 14th, the convention boasts an impressive lineup of hosts and speakers, including MC, our own, our very own, Bay. what? Keynote speaker Chris Rollins uh, from uh, creator of the Ripple Effect Leader, uh, Giuseppe Gilio from Gay.it, and Angela Yarber, author of Queering the American Dream, among others, will be participating. Early bird registration is currently open, and this exciting event will be held at the Lowe's Coral Gables Hotel, fabulous place, situated in the heart of Plaza Coral Gables. The conference lead sponsor is who we were just talking about, yeah. uh, the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. And as we have reported at Queer News tonight, Miami-Dade County is one of the world's top LGBTQ plus travel destinations. And queer travel to Miami is led by none other than a Queer News Tonight anchor, Dan Rios, one of America's top LGBTQ plus tourism experts leading the LGBT division at the Convention and Visitors Bureau. There are many events, education programs, and a special mention goes to the Flamboyance Award and Cocktail Reception. Love that name. Slated mm -hmm. for Tuesday, August 13th. Flamboyance will honor the achievements of the inclusion and inclusiveness of tourism companies and LGBTQ plus organizations across the state of Florida. Further information is available at flocc.lgbt. We are very happy, of course, that Rachel Cavello, the CEO of the Flock LGBTQ plus travel convention, is an anchor with us again. Uh, this evening on Queer News Tonight. Uh, Rachel, we're happy to you. Uh, have you. Um, let's start from the standpoint of what you do at Outcoast and why you're having this convention. Um, why, help us understand. Uh, we know about our bars, we know about our entertainment, uh, we know about our nonprofits, we know about our prides. Why is tourism important? Why? Mm -hmm. why? So, uh, you know, I started, I run Outcoast.com, which we had mentioned that focuses on LGBT inclusive destinations, attractions, businesses in Florida and beyond. We recently just expanded. Um, last year, I guess it was before last year, end of 2022, um, I had been to several conventions in Florida and beyond. I, I started in my tourism space with the IGLTA, which is based right here in uh, Fort Lauderdale. But one of the things I started noticing was I had spoken at conferences. I'd been to the governor's convention on tourism, which by the way, the governor does not go to, at least he's never been in my history of going, um, the Florida Attraction Association and some really great organizations out there that put together tourism conferences. What I started to notice though, the com conversations around DEI, but especially LGBTQ tourism topics were starting to disappear. They were starting to be pulled back from conversation. And part of that is, you know, keep in mind many of these destinations, whether it be visit Lauderdale or visit St. Pete Clearwater or visit Miami, et cetera, um, are also overseen and it's government funded. It's tax dollars that help support these organizations. Mm -hmm. And so I think when a lot of the news was happening where travel advisories were put out there, um, they also started you know, stepping back a little bit from potentially getting as involved. So out of fear, out of yeah, I think out of fear, out of lack of knowledge, out of not sure what to say at the wrong, you know, it's like a PR thing. Like, what do you say in these moments that isn't the wrong thing to say or is the right mm -hmm. thing to say? And so it just got easier to not say anything. Um, Lauderdale, of course, Stacey Ritter is an incredible leader and voice for allyship in the LGBT community and um, very much commend the work that she does and Richard Gray does for this destination. But we needed a space for these conversations, a safe space for these conversations. Yeah, and that's so, what the goal is. So that's what uh, the, you, in 2023, you did the conference in, mm -hmm. in Tampa. And uh, now you're coming to Coral Gables to South Florida. Very good choice, by the way. <laughs> and uh, so, so people come together, especially tourism experts, mm -hmm. uh, to talk about how they can broaden their appeal for LGBT travelers. Is that basically yeah, the gist of what the, happens? The main goal is to have a, again, a safe space for these conversations. It's a space to unite 
It's a space to amplify the voices of the people, the good things that are happening in the state. I'm a big fan of, you know, there's lots of places to bash leadership and, you know, complain about what's happening in the state. But given what we have right now, how do we continue marketing to LGBTQ mm -hmm. travelers? How do we continue bringing groups? How do the salespeople that are on the front line bringing meetings in, how do they deal with questions like, you know, why is Florida doing what they're doing? And do you have the appropriate bathroom set up for our transgender attendees? And so it's it's creating that space for that and then strategizing, you know, how do we work together? So what I'm very big on is having not just tourism leaders like the DMOs, destination marketing organizations, um, not just having those leaders show up, but having the hotel show up, having the attractions show up, the pride organization leaders that bring in events to destinations that drive tourism, in the LGBT space, meeting planners, travel planners, anyone who touches Florida tourism should be a part of this conversation. Anybody who's an advocate for inclusive tourism should be a part of this conversation. You know, uh, this I, I know it will not surprise Rachel, but I can't tell you in, in the five years that I've been down here, or six years now, uh, working uh, with hotspots and, and happening out. When I talk about tourism, first off, uh, uh, visit Lauderdale and Broward County is the number one LGBT tourism destination in the world. It's not New York. It's not Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It's not San Francisco. It's not London. It's Broward County. More visitors to Broward County than any other destination mm -hmm. in the world. You know where number two is? Miami-Dade County mm -hmm. in the world, <laughs> number one and number two. Mm -hmm. And when I have conversations with LGBT uh, people, business leaders, nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it's well. What's the big deal for uh, of how it affects us? In uh, what's the big deal about tourism? It creates all of our jobs, mm -hmm. whether it's direct job creation or secondary job creation. Yeah. The amount of money LGBT tourism in Broward County amounts to one billion dollars in spending from <laughs> LGBT in Broward County. Well, they buy hotel rooms and they eat in the restaurants and they go to Hunter's Nightclub and they buy concert tickets at the Master Corral <laughs> and they go on cruises, et cetera, and so on. Tourism is critically, yeah. critically important. When you face that to try to explain why LGBT tourism uh, is so important, how do you overcome that in educating? Because that's really mm. what you're doing. Yeah, you know, sadly, sometimes it really just comes down to numbers. It comes down to talking to destination leaders about the financial impact. And I hate having to start with money as the leading. It should be- Always comes down. It that should be the human that. component, but sometimes it does come down to the money depending on what destination you're working with. Um, one of the things that I've been doing a lot more and advocating for when I work for, or work with destinations on like marketing campaigns, we do marketing campaigns for Outcoast, for instance, um, is lead with empathy lead with understanding your traveler before you start talking about fancy beaches and and food and dining out you know experiences because if they don't feel safe in those spaces it all goes back to maslow's hierarchy mm -hmm. of needs if you don't have shelter food and safety you're not going anywhere so um, make sure you're addressing those first in marketing before you add on all the pretty stuff but it's so important to really think about um you know safety safety in tourism is big you ask any tourism expert. You're going where it's safe. Yeah. What's yeah. your number one thing you think about? Um, as a man, no no offense to the men in this group, but as a, you know, as a, a white, cisgender, straight male, that might not be the number one focus. But as a woman, Absolutely. Um, safety is always, especially a solo traveler. I mean, I was mm -hmm. going out last night in Miami and I asked the front desk, where's the safest place for me to go? Yeah. I wasn't worried because I was gay. I was worried because I was a single woman yeah. traveling. Yeah. But when you yeah. add on LGBT components, then you're worried about emotional safety mm, and yeah. mental safety mm. on top of the physical safety. And you have to think about those things in tourism yeah. before you think about anything Sounds else. Sounds like a fabulous opportunity uh, for people to learn about how okay. to be better in LGBT. One last question I want to ask you about in the conference. So all of these people are going to come from all over uh, to Coral Gables for the uh, three days. I'm looking forward to coming. Um, how are they going to react uh, with, uh, they aren't going to have any problems with a voice booming out like Faye Watts? Uh, <laughs> oh! <laughs> No, I mean, I remember are the name oh. of our gal is Flamboyant, Flamboyant, and I can't think of okay. someone more Flamboyant. Yeah. And did that, <laughs> come, did that name come from FL? That's what you were looking for? Yeah, so, like a, oh. so believe it or not, it was kind of perfect because Flamboyant actually also means a group of flamingos. Yes. And so uh, oh, our, I didn't know that. our convention is flamingo themed. Did you notice flamingos the drawing? Yes, right. 
gay rainbows. And the cool thing about the new AI technology. We are so now, gay, <laughs> by the way. AI now allows me to make rainbow flamingos very quickly. So uh, I've been using them. Oh, look at the, yeah. Wow. Yes. Right. Yeah. That so, is awesome, so, isn't flamboyance it? Flamboyance is obviously super gay <laughs> and super um, group of flamingos. And it just. You know what's really Perfect. cool Perfect. about that? So Our great. age group knows this. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Gen Zers have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Once upon a time, being called flamboyant was yes. a slur. So, well, it was a it was a, it was a code word it was for a being gay. Society way of More saying of that guy's gay. Yes, I'm taking, right. I'm taking that word back. I'm artistic. Taking that word back. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, I'm just making sure we're clear. No problem with being uh, a loud, boisterous. <gasps> no, I think voice. you know. It, He's oh, going to get you. Time to move on. You know, when we were planning, uh, <laughs> when we were planning the convention. Look, I'm the face of Outpost, but I didn't want to be the voice mm -hmm. necessarily of my own convention. And I also realized that in Miami. Miami culturally is very different from, you know, you I live in St. Pete. Like, we're <laughs> we're a little whiter on the other yeah. side of the country. There's and Ohio, I to... oh, and no. then there's Faze, New Jersey. <laughs> oh, no. We right. understand. Right? And so I wanted to, we also needed to represent the culture of the destination yeah. that we're in. And I think <laughs> Faye is not only a fellow lipstick <gasps> lesbian, which I love, but she's also um, Latina. And I, I want to add a little... You know, spice. Little spice. 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 All right. spice. All right. All right. While you're doing that, I'll be in the fourth <laughs> row uh, and I'll be the jeering. Oh. oh okay, okay. <laughs> no. um, uh, uh, one last thing. Uh, <laughs> remind everybody how uh, they get more information. Yeah. So um, if you go to the, the easiest way is go to www.flocc.lgbt. Um, do not go to .com or .org or you'll go to a religious yeah. The, uh, yeah. The whole, uh, flocking, a different yeah. kind of flock. So and, uh, you know, <laughs> one, one last thought before we move no about, uh, patiently waiting for me. Um, one of the things that I, I think is wonderful in this and, and having our conversation tonight on this, so many of our different stories of Brett. One of the things I think is wonderful about our community is when we can demonstrate, wait, we're not any one thing. We are everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we represent mm -hmm. everything. Multitudes. Our, multitudes uh, of our community. It just makes our community stronger. So mm -hmm. we're really exciting. <laughs> August 12th <laughs> through the 14th Thank you. Uh, down at the Lowe's in uh, uh, Coral Gables. That's a beautiful hotel, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my uh, God. You think? <laughs> it came down. We had two hotels we were looking at, and that hotel... Yeah. above and beyond impressed. Yeah, so. beautiful. All right, Yvonne. Next, <laughs> we're proud of our special partnership with Sunshine Cathedral, the world's largest queer church here in Fort Lauderdale. Supporting that partnership, we're broadcasting from our permanent set here at Sunshine Cathedral at the Happening Out Television Studios. We broadcast Sunshine Cathedral Sunday international service at 10.30 a.m. Well, now we finish tonight's Queer News headlines with a segment we call LGBTQ Plus One Minute News. LGBTQ Plus One Minute News. Let's queer up politics. Mississippi GOP, latest state that failed to pass anti-LGBTQ plus laws. In Mississippi, two proposed laws lim limiting transgender rights failed to advance to a final vote due to a lack of compromise among the Republican majority on the language. 
One bill aimed to restrict restroom use, and another bill defined sex as immutable from birth. It continues to be a 2024 trend that anti-LGBTQ plus laws don't pass in states across America. Well, I don't want to get too complacent or comfortable, but if this is the beginning of a trend, along with what happened in Kentucky, I hope it continues in our favor. Yeah, me too. Well, one Mississippi, two Uh, Mississippi, uh, to my GOP friends, so sad, Mississippi. (laughs) Surprised that they're not getting along or collaborating properly. Thank you. All right, Yvonne, we're going to move to you, I believe. LGBTQ plus one minute news. Let's queer up entertainment. Kevin Hart thanks Wanda Sykes for helping him understand the harm caused by his homophobic jokes. Finally. Kevin Hart's appearance on 60 Minutes with Anderson Cooper recently had an interesting moment on LGBTQ+. The segment addressed the backlash following his selection as a host for the 2019 Academy Awards. The backlash was sparked by the resurfacing of his old anti-gay tweets and jokes. Initially resistant to apologizing, Hart later issued an apology, and he credited Wanda Sykes with enlightening him. Well... Thank you, Wanda, for educating, but should we really still have to go around educating public figures like that? What do you think? Well, where would we be without St. Wanda? We love St. Wanda, but that still doesn't make Kevin Hart funny. (laughs) And it's also, it is funny to me uh, that I might not have given Kevin Hart a pass, except Wanda Sykes commented on it and said he was sincere. In a moment she said it, Okay, I'm all in. Okay. LGBTQ plus one minute news. Let's queer up gay culture. The new Bridgerton season three is here, and Jess Brunel says queer storyline is a priority. Jess Brunel, the showrunner of the hit Netflix series Bridgerton, has announced that queer storylines will take center stage in the show's highly anticipated third season, set to premiere on May 16th for LGBTQ plus fans who have longed to see themselves represented in this period romance set in the 19th century London high society. This news comes as a great and positive development. I am an uber Bridgerton fan. I can't wait to watch season three and I can't uh, wait to See who uh, Lady uh, Whistledown is going to read next. Uh-huh. And the costumes. I've never. I can only imagine the ones that are for the gay characters <laughs> being even better. I've never actually seen Bridgerton. <sighs> Your but card I'm is hoping... suspended for three months. <laughs> but I'm hoping that the Hallmark Channel takes notes. There you go. <laughs> well, I have enough trouble keeping up with the 21st century drama, so I'll have to pass on the 19th. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, Um, LGBTQ plus one minute news. Let's clear up the USA view. North Carolina restaurant sues anti-drag protesters for slander. In North Carolina, a contentious cultural dispute has escalated to the federal level. East Frank Superette and Kitchen, a restaurant located in Monroe, known for hosting drag shows, has filed a lawsuit against a group of protesters. These protesters have accused the establishment of promoting, grooming, and sexualizing children. It's about time that these establishments stand up for their their rights yeah. to host whatever they want. And I didn't see any chil- and- I didn't see any children anyway, but Well, and as far as I'm concerned, the protesters are the groomers promoting the teaching of hatred of children. To and children. then lying. That's about right, of it, course. Yeah. Which is slander. <laughs> and then what <gasps> is interesting <laughs> is there's this new trend to be able to say, okay, you can say whatever you want, but unless you can prove it's true, uh-huh. we're going to get 87 million. Oh, wait, that's a different story. <laughs> oh. <laughs> LGBTQ okay. plus one minute news. Let's queer up entertainment. Marvel's first look of Mystique and Destiny's wedding of the year. Now, to a lot of people my age, you don't know about this story that I'm getting ready to tell you. Mystique and Destiny from X-Men are gearing up for the wedding event of the year. 
Fans worldwide are eager, eagerly anticipating the celebration of one of the most cherished and enduring queer relationships in comic book lore. It's a love story that has endured for a remarkable 100 years. This event has secured the number one spot in this year's Marvel, Marvel's Voices of Pride lineup. I'm not a comic guy. But a very close friend of mine is, and in fact, buying collectibles as we speak uh, in uh, Sarasota. And he mentioned to me that this is the story of the summer uh, for comic book collectors. I, I think my generation was waiting for Wonder Woman to have the same experience. Ooh. But I also have to say that 100 years in lesbian years is like a 1,000 years. I mean, yeah, when did they bring sure. the U-Haul? Yeah. <laughs> did they go in there? And now they're just now getting married. <laughs> well, when was she holding her breath for 100 years? Is that why her face was blue? <laughs> true. All right. Well, that is today's news for the LGBTQ plus community on the world's first and only daily LGBTQ plus evening news show. If our community is important to you, share this news with your friends and family. Are you, like most of America, part of our very large television audience watching this live LGBTQ plus news broadcast right now on Roku, Apple TV, Android TV, and Amazon Fire TV? Queer News Tonight is the only live LGBTQ plus digital television show in the world that is out of the closet and into the headlines. We need your support. If our community is to grow, we must tell our stories and bring them to the attention of the broader world. This is the only place in the world that tells these types of LGBTQ plus stories in motion and sound. That is the passion of Hot Spots Magazine, Happening Out Television Network, and Queer News Tonight. I'm your anchor. Al Ferguson, and on behalf of these LGBTQ plus reporters, the anchors of Queer News tonight, including Greg Shapiro, Yvonne Robacher, Rachel Cavello, and Brett Carlin. We will see you daily at 8 p.m. And to our LGBTQ plus world, we wish you good night. Good night. Good night.